Welcome to Uncall It. I'm Kevin Metcalf. Um, today, I'm going to end this series, or at least put a stop to this particular iteration of the series on materialism. And just for a quick recap, just so I can uh, refocus um, the conversation, or conversation, <laughs> so I can refocus the presentation because my, my goal isn't to debate or prove or argue anything regarding whether materialism is true or um, the, the idea that I advocate, which is dualism, Cartesian dualism. I don't know it's necessarily Cartesian dualism, but just dualism. Um, that's not really my, my goal. Um, the, the whole idea, <clears throat> really just the whole idea behind what I'm doing here is um, I'm hoping to promote individuals to think for themselves. That's really what this is all about. Um, and a lot of the information that you get from all kinds of different quarters seem to encourage you to either believe what I'm saying or we're coming after you. You, you agree with my scientific conclusions or you're a bad person. You, you, believe, you agree with my political stance or you're evil. You, you agree with my social whatever or you're bad. And th that seems like the most idiotic way to try and understand how reality is. <laughs> um, and so my, I, it just seems to me that it's better if you have people who, again, think for themselves, look, survey as much of the data as possible, and being aware of your own preconceived um, presuppositions, preconceived ideas, your, your own presuppositions, which we all seem to have, being aware of those, just try and look at the data and see what it tells you through a prism or a boundary of logic and reason. That's how it seems. And so the reason I started this whole thing was a couple of reasons. The first one was, was this, and I, I'm just going to go through it briefly, um, just in case, you know, you're new to this and you're, you don't know why I'm rambling on. Of course, of course, this might not make a difference. Um, you still might know what I'm rambling about. But it started with um, me going back through my notes and coming across this, this um, statement or something that this guy named Richard Lewinton wrote, um, who was a, a geneticist from uh, back in the day. And it was, it was interesting that what he, what, what he wrote seemed to be more revealing than I think he intended it to be as I looked at it. And I've seen this several times. But I thought it was very revealing because there's this irony where he says that at the end, he kind of sums up by saying, we don't want all kinds of wacky ideas. But the worldview that he adheres to necessarily, or it seems to even because of the idea, you're going to get wacky crazy ideas, which seemed odd to me that you start out with wacky ideas and then you end up holding to it because you don't want to have a different set of wacky ideas. It seemed like that was a smokescreen for something different. Um, so let me just read it to you and I'll just give you my ideas. You can think, you know, you come to your own conclusions, but this is how it got me thinking. Um, at the beginning, it says, uh, Professor Richard Lewinton, a geneticist and self-proclaimed Marxist, uh, was certainly one of the world's leaders in evolutionary biology. Uh, he wrote this revealing comment. Um, well, I'll just get to the comment. Anyway. Uh, so this is Lewinton. It starts, Our willingness to accept uh, scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to understanding the real struggle between science and the supernatural. Now, just for a moment, again, I, I'll try not to butt in. I, I can't seem to stop interrupting myself. <laughs> but I think I did something on this previously. There's a, there's, there are some people in science, I don't know, and out of science, who want to perpetuate this idea that there's some sort of a conflict between science and believing in God. Um, it's nonsense, it seems to me. It seems like a complete and total uh, fabrication. And it seems like that's a bad conclusion that you come to if you hold a particular worldview, and that would be the presupposition that God doesn't exist. There are many people who are atheists who think that, and we'll, we'll get into this, it'll be another topic, hopefully, I don't know what happens, we'll get into later on, this idea that, that the Enlightenment somehow came along and set the world aright, okay? 
Um, that's the common uh, idea among a lot of atheists and a lot of scientists. I don't think that that's necessarily true, but we'll look at that another day. But the whole point I just wanted to make clear is that anybody who tells you that there's a conflict between science and uh, believing in God uh, is nonsense, and I'll just give you one piece of evidence. Um, I think it's something like over 65% of Nobel Prize w winners believe in God in some way, shape, or form. And only about, I think it's like 11% atheists are, are winners of Nobel Prizes. So you would think if that there was some sort of a conflict between believing in God and science, that number would have flipped somehow, it seems to me. Just, I think that's empirical data. So I just wanted to make that point because Lewinton seems to operate, in my opinion, under the same misapprehension that there's some sort of a conflict. But that's that's where he's going from. And again, when you're dealing with somebody else's idea, you you want to you want to take you know you want to start from what they're saying. He continues, we take the side of science, as if there was a side to take, in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its uh, extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated, just so stories because we have a prior commitment to materialism. It's not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary. So, Again, he's making it clear. He doesn't accept materialism or he doesn't think materialism exists because it better explains scientific data. I think that's what he's making clear right there. There's a different reason. Okay. On the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations. That's why I think materialism exists. In my opinion, he's basically saying we need something that keeps God out. That's why we do it this way. No matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is absolute. This is the idea of uh, causal closure when he says it's absolute. Because if you have, if, if you're going to say that everything's material, then there can be no immaterial things that affect material things. There can be no immaterial causation. That's this idea, this concept of um, causal closure. I think it's what it's called. Um, materialism is absolute for we cannot allow a divine foot for, for through the door. And he's telling you right there, that's why I don't want, that's why he's, he adheres to this materialistic system. He doesn't want to talk about God. And I think at least as I look through these ideas from scientists and philosophers and, and whatnot, um, that seems to be a motivating factor for many people who deny the existence of God. It, it doesn't seem to be because God is, the, is a better explanation for all that we see. It seems to be something like, I don't like God, so I need an idea that excludes God. That's how it seems to me. And finally, he goes to this eminent Kant scholar, uh, Louis Beck. Uh, it says, the eminent Kant scholar, Louis Beck, used to say that anyone who could believe in God could believe in anything. To appeal to an omnipotent deity is to allow any of the mo uh, at any moment the regularities of nature uh, may be ruptured, miracles may happen. Now, in my opinion, this is just simply the, um, the admission that, listen, I want to be in control. I don't want a God in control of reality. I want to be in control of reality. And I think that this is part of what led me to that uh, video of Sabine Hassenfelder that you can see in other videos. I'm, I'm going to try not to refer to her because it seems like I'm, I'm banging on her and slamming her and I, I don't want to do that. She seems to be a nice person doing her job, trying to do the right thing. And it's really not about Sabine. It's about an attitude towards ideas. And this is an attitude towards ideas that says either you agree with me or you're bad or evil or stupid. And that seemed to be the approach that Sabine Hassenfelder was taking. Now, I objected to that based on just some of the ideas that I think are, are rival to materialism and have better explanatory power to explain the things that we see. And, and it seems to me clear that at the very least, a dogmatic approach to materialism being the only way to understand reality 
just seems dumb. That's how it seemed to me. And that's why I, I kind of got on this little rant. My goal isn't to, to, to prove one over the other. I think that uh, dualism is by far the better um, idea. It, it doesn't have any weird loops where you have to, you know, do any kind of crazy shenanigans and things can be what they seem to be. Um, you can believe your senses. And so it just makes more sense. But you can believe what you want. My only goal is to provide you with some data to let you know that there are some very, very, very smart people who see things differently. And I think these people, at the very least, I mean, know at least what Sabine knows about science. Again, it's not about Sabine. Anybody who would take <laughs> such a dogmatic approach from either side, by the way. And, and this is why. Dogma, it seems to me, makes you ignorant. If your idea, if your belief system is supported by objective data, then it should be clear to everybody. And if it's not clear to everybody, well, then you should deal with that. And if you're not willing to deal with that, being dogmatic doesn't help. Jumping down and screaming like, we know, we know, and, and, and repeating yourself, trying to, 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 in a sense, talk over everybody else who disagrees with you, it, it doesn't help, it doesn't change what the data says. If your data is clear, it should stand on its own. And if people want to believe it, they can believe it. If they don't want to believe the clear data, then it's fine. But if somebody says, well, we've got some data and that, that proves some significant challenges to what you're believing and you don't want to deal with it, I don't know that being dogmatic about a bad idea helps. And, and that's really what this is all about. So I, I, I wanted to put that out there because there were previous, um, I, in the previous video, I, I um, uh, acknowledged some of the comments or addressed some of the comments. Um, and I think they were right in one respect. I, I don't know what I'm talking about. I, I'm not nearly uh, as smart as any of these people or understand it as well as any of these folks here. They're correct. On the other hand, I really don't think you need to know that much. It seems pretty simple. It's not, I don't think it's that kind of a, a complicated idea. It's pretty straightforward. But nevertheless, what I wanted to do in this particular um, presentation is I wanted to just give you some of the folks who I think understand it better than me, because again, I don't know what I'm talking about, and, and it's not a good thing when I think I do. That's, that's, that's not good for anybody, if I think I know what I'm talking about. Anyway, so the first person I'm going to present to you is this gentleman. His name is Douglas Axe, and I'll just read to you quickly uh, his, his bio. Douglas Axe is the Maxwell Professor of Molecular, Molecular Biology at Biola University, the founding direct, director of Biologic Institute, the founding editor of Biocomplexity, and the author of Undeniable, How, uh, Biological, I'm sorry, How Biology Confirms Our Intuition That Life Is Designed. Fantastic book. I read it. Uh, I, I encourage everybody to read that book. After completing his Ph.D. at Caltech, he held uh, postdoctoral and research scientist positions at the University of Cambridge and the Cambridge Medical Research Council Center. His research, which examines the functional and structural constraints on the evolution of proteins and protein systems, has been featured in many scientific journals, including uh, the Journal of Molecular Biology, uh, the, Proceeding, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, Biocomplexity, and nature. So while it's clear, uh, I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know that you can say that same thing about Douglas Axe. So here's what Douglas Axe seems to think uh, about materialism. Uh, probes on your head and all kinds of instrumentation. This can even be futuristic. It could have far more instrumentation than is possible today. But let's pretend that they can image absolutely everything that's happening in your brain in real time and show it up on a display. They can, they can see everything that's going on in there. And this scientist who's got all this stuff on your head says, <clears throat> ask you to count from one to 10 and you count. And he says, think about these numbers, you count, you're counting, he stops you at two. And he or she says, here's the image that we got when you said two. See the activated reg region there in the, in the frontal lobe? Is that what you mean when you say two? And you say, 
Maybe that was activated in my brain, but that's not what I mean when I say two. He's saying, I'm trying to pinpoint what you mean when you say two. And you say, I don't mean that. I mean a number, the number after one. And he says, no, no, I'm, he's a, I'm a physicalist. There is nothing outside the physical universe. There is only the physical universe, which means whatever you mean when you say two, it has to be something physical. So I'm just trying to find out what it is that you mean when you say two. And you say, I'm not meaning something physical. I'm talking about an idea. It's not to be found in my head. Well, let's zero in a little more Specifically, I saw this, we, we captured data on this particular synapse that fired between these neurons in this cluster of your frontal lobe in that red region of your brain when you were thinking of the number two. Is that what you mean when you say two? And you say, no, you don't get it. There's nothing in my brain that I mean when I say two. I'm thinking of a number, okay? And if they were to insist, a team of these scientists were to say, no, no, you, you, there is nothing but the physical world. So what do you mean when you say two? I would say if you insist that what I mean when I say two doesn't exist, then I, I am insane. And all the words that I'm using, if they don't mean anything, if you're telling me the things that I think they mean don't exist, then you're saying I'm confused deeply about what I mean when I'm using words, which means I'm deeply confused. And that means I do lose all confidence in my thinking project. I thought I could think, but if you're telling me I'm confused about everything I'm saying, then I can't think, okay? So this is exactly what we mean by self-refuting scientific proposition. We're left with these two options. Either I am manipulating concepts, non-physical ideas, when I think, or I am being manipulated by neurons. I'm being tricked into thinking that I'm doing that. But if I'm being tricked into thinking that I'm doing it, I don't even know if neurons exist. I don't know if labs exist. I don't know if science exists. All of it is gone if I can't think because now I've lost confidence in the very thing that I needed to do in order to get there, right? So I, I can rule out B. That cannot be true without exploding the whole thing. Everything implodes if I take, if I accept or I try to accept that I'm being deceived by neurons into thinking I'm thinking, then neurons don't even exist. I'm, I'm just confused. That is precisely this situation. B self-destructs and it leaves you with A. I am manipulating concepts. Concepts are not physical. I am working with ideas when I think. There is no other coherent way to understand thought. So we have to have this picture of reality. There is a material realm. We're not denying that our brains are physical. We're not denying the physical world. But there has to be this mental immaterial realm above it. And a thinker has to be one of these special places in the universe where these two things come together, where there is the immaterial me, the thinker that is not material, that by God's divine hand, there's a marriage between this immaterial thought and thinker world that touches my brain and becomes actions that live out in the physical world. And the other way too. So I see you only because physical light is coming into my eyes, impinging on my brain, and then popped up into the mental realm. And someone has to be in charge of that interface between the two. And it can't be material, because my ideas cannot be physical, and I don't know how to run a brain. Do you know how to run a brain? I don't have the faintest idea how to work a brain. So I'm not the one who's doing that. Someone else is doing this, taking my thoughts and pushing them into the physical brain so that I can move the physical world so that I can talk with you and you can talk with me. This is a proof of the incoherence of physicalism and materialism. And by the way, we've talked about multiverse and talked about problems with multiverse. Here's a proof that the multiverse can't explain reality because physics can't explain reality and all you have in multiverse is physics. We are not physical. We're not purely physical. We have physical bodies but our minds are not physical. So listen, um, Douglas Axe seems to think that there are problems with materialism also. Again, you believe what you want to believe, but I, I think that makes sense. Um, if, you, if the mind isn't primary and, and the material world is primary, then you're going to have a problem with the reliability of anything you think because it's not controlled by you, the immaterial you, the real you is what I think is going on. 
It's controlled by some random firing of atoms. Atoms. So whatever you're getting, there's no way to assign any truth value to it because it's manipulating you, not you understanding concepts and ideas in material. That's how it seems to me. Um, here's somebody else. This is a guy named uh, Angus Manuge. <laughs> I love that name. Angus Manuge is the professor of philosophy at, at uh, Concordia University in Wisconsin and president of the Evangelical Philosophical Society. His research interests include philosophy of mind, philosophy of science, apologetics, and C.S. Lewis. That's just a short uh, part of his bio. Okay, so now he's going to go on and talk about um, a couple of things. Artificial intelligence, but he's basically going to talk about the difference between machines and minds. And there are very, maybe subtle, but I think very significant differences that he's going to get into. He's going to begin with this, um, uh, an example by, of the, I don't know if you heard of the, the Chinese, um, the, the Chinese um, room project where, you know, you, it's a try and, I'll let, I'll let him explain it to you. So there it is, the man in the Chinese room. He is given questions, okay, which are in Chinese symbols. He has a book that correlates the questions with answers. And so by matching the patterns or syntax, as Saul says, he can provide the correct answer to a question. And Saul's point, of course, is that Typical artificial intelligent programs are doing that. They are doing pattern processing and pattern matching. And given a certain pattern that means something, either to us or someone else, they can produce a pattern that means, also means something to us or someone else, but it doesn't mean anything to the machine. It doesn't have to. Okay. And the problem there really is with what he calls intentionality, which I'll come, come back to, which is not knowing what the symbols are about. They're being matched, as it were, by their shape or their appearance, but not by their content. So this person could pass as an intelligent, well, assuming he's awfully quick at you know, paging through books, uh, <laughs> as an intelligent Chinese speaker without understanding any Chinese at all. Basically, because there's this metaphysical gap, I claim, between machines and the way the mind works. And I think it's all machines. It's even the brain, if you want to think of the brain purely physically. There's a gap between the brain understood as a physical device uh, and what the mind is capable of. The mind has, I claim, intrinsic intelligence. And I can't talk about all the aspects of this. But four characteristics, subjectivity. Only subjects can have thoughts. Okay. Now you might say, what about a library? Well, a library contains information, but a book does not contain thoughts. The mind of the author contains thoughts. A library book only contains information. And if you speak your thoughts or you write them down, you produce either a noise in the air or an inscription on paper, but those words are not thoughts. The thought resides only in a mind. Intentionality is critical, the ability to think about other things. We can direct our thoughts on other things. Teleology, that we have our own goals, personal goals, and rationality, the ability to reason. And you might think that's surprising, because surely if there's one thing AI can do, it's very good at reasoning and solving problems, but I'll claim that Artificial intelligence systems do not reason in the way that we do. And there's a gap there, all of the same. So those are just some of the differences that Angus Manuge thinks distinguishes machines from minds. Again, you can agree or disagree. Uh, but again, somebody who spent, you know, a long time researching and, and studying about the issue, uh, I think his opinion is at the very least is something that should be considered. Um, as far as the John Searle, I'm sorry, I don't know if his name is John Searle. He had a different first name. But anyway, Searle's Chinese Room. Um, kind of, you know, I, I think I was saying it's something similar where you can program machines to do all kinds of things. It, it, but that doesn't imply that they're aware of what they're doing. It's just simply they're responding to this comes in, I do this. 
and that's just based on the program. The, the idea that they have any knowledge or can assign truth value to the things they're doing, that seems to take a mind to me. But again, you, you go with what the, you've already heard me. Uh, you can deal with uh, Angus Manoj. And let me see, who else do I have? Finally, I've got, I forgot who this is. Oh, Michael Egner. Michael Egner, I uh, presented his video, I think I think in the last presentation I did, I put uh, a little bit of Michael Egner, I dropped a little bit of it on you. Um, but this is fantastic. So what Michael Egner is going to talk about, he's a very strong proponent of the duality of mind and uh, body. But one of the things that he points out there's this fantastic experiment. It's going to be a little bit long, so I, I encourage you to stay there, but I'll put the, the link in the video so you can see the whole thing for yourself. The whole interview is fantastic, but this particular one I, I urge you to hang in, uh, hang in there for because he talks about, I guess they're studying people who are in vegetative states, persistent vegetative states where the brain is basically not working anymore, yet it can respond to questions like people who have a fully functioning brain. Um, so here's Michael Egner on that. In 2006, uh, a, uh, a neuroscientist named Owen published uh, a landmark uh, uh, study in the Journal of Science uh, looking at brain function in people who were in persistent vegetative state. Persistent vegetative state is a condition where a person has such severe brain damage that they show no sign of consciousness at all. It's basically a persistent deep coma. And it can go on for years. Uh, and many times people who are diagnosed as being in persistent veg vegetative state, uh, for example from a car accident or from a lack of oxygen to the brain, something like that, many times their family and, and sometimes their, their caretakers will say, but I get the sense that the person is there, that they understand things, but there's no clinical evidence for it. You examine them, there's no sign of any reaction at all. And on scan, their brains are, are shrunken and obviously severely damaged. So <clears throat> Owen did a fascinating experiment. He used a technique called functional MRI imaging, which is an MRI machine that images changes in blood flow in the brain that seems to correlate with brain function. So if you're moving your arm, the part of your brain that involves moving your arm lights up on the on a functional MRI. Um, if you're thinking about stuff, your frontal lobes light up, things like that. So what Owen did is that he took a woman who had been diagnosed for several years in persistent vegetative state from a car accident, uh, who showed no sign at all of any awareness, deep coma, put her in the MRI machine and um, asked her questions a little microphone and head and headset. He said, um, pretend that you're playing tennis or imagine that you're walking across the room. He asked her to imagine all these things and her brain kind of lit up in places. But you could say that, well, the brain lighting up doesn't mean she was understanding anything. It just meant maybe the sound coming into her ears was causing a reflex or something. So what he did was he took 15 normal people and he did the same thing with them, stuck them in the machine put, and asked the same questions. And then he asked neuroradiologists to look at the functional MRI images of this woman and the 15 normal people and see if you could tell a difference between the two. And they couldn't. Her pattern of reaction was identical to the normal people. That seemed to imply that she could understand what he was asking, even though medically she was diagnosed as having no, no mind at all. And he, did, and he did something that was very clever, that absolutely fascinates me. And he said, maybe the lighting up of areas in, in her brain and the lighting up of the areas in normal people's brains was not because of understanding, was, but was just because of the reception of the sound. And that it didn't really mean she understood. So what he then did is he took the same words that he had asked her before, and he asked them again, but he mixed, them, but he mixed the sequence of the words, so they didn't make any sense. Walking, understand, pretend, room across. So he took away the semantics and just left some syntax. And her brain stopped, stopped reacting, as did the normal controls. Her brain only reacted when what he said to her made sense. It didn't react from just sound. So Owen's work was 
a landmark study, and it made people begin to question these folks who were in persistent vegetative state, are they really unaware? And so his study has been repeated by a number of different investigators, and they're probably, last I looked, there were 40 or 50 patients who had been studied by other investigators. And at least half of them show the same thing that he found, that even when your brain is so massively destroyed that there's no clinical evidence for any mental activity at all, functional MRI can find that these patients are capable of thinking in quite, quite clear ways. And um, there are some patients who can do mathematics. That is that what, what some researchers have done is they will ask uh, a person in persistent veg vegetative state uh, to do simple math. What's eight plus six? And then, and then give them different answers. And when you, when, you, when, you, when you hit the right answer, the brain lights up. So very clearly, there are aspects of the mind that cannot be destroyed by severe brain damage. That's what Owen's work is showing us. It's showing us there are aspects of the mind that aren't connected tightly to the brain that are immaterial. Okay. That was Michael Egner. Uh, and I think that that's, fan, that's just fascinating, that, that whole thing. And, and you know what? I didn't read this on the front end, but I'll read it for you now just so you can see that Michael Egner also seems to be somebody who I think is credible on this particular topic. Uh, Michael R. Egner, MD, is a professor of neurosurgery and pediatrics at State University of New York, Stony Brook, uh, has served as the director of pediatric neurosurgery and the award-winning, oh, sorry, and award-winning brain surgeon. He was named one of New York's best doctors by New York Magazine in 2005. He received his medical education at Columbia University, um, College of Physicians and Surgeons, and completed his residency at Jackson Memorial Hospital. His research on hydrocephalus has been published in journals including Journal of Neuro uh, Neurosurgery, uh, Pediatrics, and uh, Cerebral Spinal Fluid Research. He's on the scientific uh, advisory board of the Hydrocephalus Association of the United States and is lectured extensively throughout the United States and Europe. So here we have again, Michael Egner. Again, you might question the conclusions that he's drawn from the data, but I, I don't think that you can question his um, credentials. Um, I think he's somebody that knows what he's talking about. So the whole point of this, again, trying to prove one side or the other. I know what, what conclusions that I've come to based on the data that I've seen, and I think that I've looked at both sides well enough. And my opinion is, when I say well enough, I mean, I, I spent some time looking at both sides. And it just seems to me that dualism has far more explanatory power than materialism does. That's how it seems to me. And you've just seen some of the data, but it's extensive. Um, you can go to, uh, there's a couple of books. I've, I've already told you the Blackwell Companion uh, of Natural Theology. But there's al also a, another book that I just came across. It's um, the Blackwell Companion to Substance Dualism, um, a, a book that I wanted to get, but... <laughs> The price was prohibitive. Um, so I don't know. I'll try to figure something out. Maybe I'll rent it. Rent it. Would you do it? Check it out at the library? Of course, if I can't get it on audiobook, I probably can't. I won't read it anyway. But the point is, there's tons of information out there that can give you a broader range, and there's far more out there than what I've covered. The only point I'm making is, when you run into someone, whoever it is, whatever their credentials are, who tells you if you don't believe the way I believe or understand the data the way I understand it, or you're bad, or you're stupid, or you'll never figure it out. You're talking to an idiot. That's my point. I'm not saying they're an idiot I'll, you know, the whole way through. Clearly, there are very brilliant people who are doing that. I'm saying on that particular topic, they have become stupid. Because they've dug their feet into the mud. And it doesn't matter what other information's out there. They're not going to look at it or even consider it against their own. And I don't know how you can stay intelligent on any topic if that's what you do. And so that's really the whole point of this thing. Um, not to tell you who's right, not to tell you who's wrong. I think I know. I know who I think is right. But who am I? You know, what, what, what do I know? The idea of... Uh, 
of being dogmatic is not something that is just for people who don't believe in God. It happens to people who believe in God. It's, it's not a, a God thing or a not God thing. And, and that's why I referred to um, that statement by Lewinton earlier, because he quotes this Lewis Beck, or at least assigns this quotation to Lewis Beck, or this saying to Lewis Beck, that anybody who can believe in God could believe in anything. And I don't think that's the case. It seems to me that people who believe in God and people who don't believe in God can have some nutty and wacky ideas. Both can also be insanely, ignorantly dogmatic about them pushing their ideas on other people, which is bad. So my point is, it, it really doesn't matter whether you believe in God. You can be a... <laughs> I don't want to say that. You can be a bad person. Not a bad person. You can be stupid and know all the things about a, a subject. You can have all the credentials. You can believe in God or you can not believe in God and, and be ignorantly dogmatic about something. That's really the point. We, we all have to, I think, be aware of that. that. That's really the point of all this. Whether you agree with me or disagree with me, nobody really cares. I mean, you know, you, you can do what you want. So next week, what I'm going to do is, since I've spent so much time picking on the, the, the non-theist side, I'm going to go and talk about somebody on the theist side. I've, I've had a, I showed a quick clip of them uh, a couple of videos uh, ago alongside of Sabine, who, um, you know, was interesting. So I'm going to go and just show you that it's just not, again, whether you believe in God or not. So I'm going to pick on somebody who's, who believes in God and who, in my opinion, is a little, you know, coming a little bit hot. Um, I just don't think that's a good, a good idea uh, for anybody. All right, I'm rambling now. Thanks for tuning in to Uncolored. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope this was short enough because, again, I, I don't want to belabor a, a beat a dead horse or anything like that. But, again, I, I, I want to encourage people to think for themselves and to not feel bludgeoned by those people in the science community, in the public. I was just looking at this, I was just looking at this thing as I was uh, going through the, the videos. There's a hockey player who's getting beat up because he doesn't sign on to the to the gay pride agenda. You know, it's not enough that you don't mind what people do in their own homes or you know, in their own privacy. Now, openly, you have to bow down to other people's social agendas. And if you're not part of their social, if you're not a Black Lives Matter advocate, then somehow you're you're open to ridicule and punishment. And it's it's this insanity and it's a religious fundamentalist fervor with which some people hold to their ideas. And that's the thing that I think is evil. Don't care what you believe. I really don't. That, that's between you and God, and you're going to have to answer for that one day. I'm, I'm not here to tell you how to, to navigate the world. But I got to tell you, when, when, you're, when you're somebody, you're a scientist, you're some social activist or whatever the hell you are, and you feel it's okay, to impose how you see the world on other people in a fashion that says, if you don't agree with me, then, then you need to be punished or you're bad or you're stupid. I just think you're going about it the wrong way. And I don't think that helps anybody. And I think whether you're a scientist, whether you're gay, whether you're black, I think the people who are in your community, and I think it's, and I usually think, and here's what I think. I think it's a small vocal minority of those com the community who act so stupid about those ideas. Science, social, whatever it is. And it's those idiots who are always out there making noise for everybody else who just wants to be left alone with their ideas. That's what I think it is. I don't know. I got off on a little bit of soapbox there, but <laughs> it, just <laughs> it just strikes me as nonsense. I don't know. All right. Get out of here. Uh, I'm Kevin Metcalf. Please, I, I love your support. I love your comments. Those are fantastic. And and just, you know, because I, I, the reason I like that is because I, hopefully I'm saying some things that, that you know, can, can help you out a little bit, or at least you're finding some value in it. That's really what this is about. So thanks a lot. I'll see you next time. All right, get out of here. That's enough.